Windsor Castle has been one of the principal residences of the kings and queens of England and Britain for nearly a thousand years. And as a result, many of them have left their mark on it. We've got the rebuild by Edward III or George IV. One king that's left his mark in a slightly different way is George III. He was one of the world's greatest collectors of military maps. He had thousands of them, and they're still stored here in his beloved Windsor Castle. Today I've been given exclusive access to have a look at them. Showing me some of the highlights from this extraordinary collection is the head of prints and drawings, Martin Clayton. Hello there. Hi. How are you? This is an amazing room. What have we got here? Well, this is George III's collection of military maps. These are the 4,000 maps of battles, wars across the globe that he put together throughout his life as a student of military theory and history. Now, he was a student. Was he just an enthusiast, like, you know, the way we give our fathers-in-law the latest big tome <laughs> for Christmas? Or, or, or he was also commander-in-chief of the yes. British Armed Forces? Yes, I mean, he was both. You know, he took his responsibilities as commander-in-chief seriously. But he was also a man of the Enlightenment, and he believed fundamentally in the rational basis of military uh, action, behaviour, planning of battles, victualling of troops, uh, how you order route marches and so on. And you know, he wanted to have the evidence in front of him. So which one have we got there? This looks well, amazing. yes, this material is not from George's own period of activity. This is material that he acquired from his uncle, Duke of Cumberland. Ah, it's the Battle of the man so who won Culloden. the Battle of exactly. Culloden. Exactly. Yeah. Culloden was the, the final battle of the Jacobite Rebellion where Cumberland crushed the Jacobite forces. Bonnie and these, Prince Charlie, 16th Bonnie of Prince April, Charlie, 1746. Exactly. And these are all Cumberland's papers, both finished maps produced after the event as mementos in some ways, but also campaign documents, things that were actually drawn up on the battlefield. This is this is one of the most extraordinary documents I've ever seen. This, this is him on the battlefield actually saying where his various regiments were, like yeah. barrels, which famously bore the brunt of the Jacobite attack. Well, we think this is in Cumberland's own hand. Oh, and you wow. can see the crossings out as he sees the Jacobite forces range before him, spots a weakness, and so diverts one of his um, yeah, units the right to, the, yeah. to the right flank. Exactly. So this is the Battle of Culloden unfolding on paper in front of you. And it looks a bit shaky, so he could have been in the saddle. On the horse, was, exactly. Yeah. I mean, this is like quite a large sheet of paper. It's not just sort of oh, held in the palm of the hand. What an object. The wind blowing in off the Firth of Forth. Uh, yeah, of in a, in a um, hailstorm. Murray Firth, sorry, and he's, you know, he's, he's trying, to get, um, trying to get everything down. And so this is the, we think this might be the, the map actually from the battlefield. And this yes. was the one produced a few days later, was it? Which is all... Yeah, this, this was produced um, by Thomas Sandby who was working for the uh, Board of Ordnance at the time. I went on to become a great watercolourist, but this uh, was done as a young man, as a record of exactly how the troops were laid out, and of the, the losses on both sides. The Pretender, that's what they call yep. Bonnie Prince Charlie. So there he is. Charles Edward Stuart, the Duke of Perth, Lord George Murray. There you go, they got the Dragoons, the cavalry coming through into this flank, famously. And then they did their Highland Charge down here and were slaughtered by these regiments there. And here we have numbers, rebels killed and taken, yeah. killed at least 2000, taken prisoners 1200. And the different clans that provided oh, the, the troops for there, it, yeah. it listed yeah. down there. There's, I love that, that's Barrel's regiment. They were, they were obliterated by the Highland Charge, but there was enough hmm. backup that they could just be repelled there. Amazing. And then a printed version was produced from that. And this is typical of the, uh, sort of the memorabilia, if you like, that was produced afterwards. But yeah, while, see, while that's the official one, yeah. published by authority, this is a map produced by the other side. Oh, I've never seen this before. How oh, fascinating. So and this, they call him Prince Edward here, so this is, yeah. a, ja this is a Jacobite This is a Jacobite map. one. Really? Exactly. exactly. This is beautiful, isn't Drawn it? by J. Grant, Colonel of the Artillery to the Prince in ah, Scotland. right. Engraved in Edinburgh, inscribed to all the honest. So this is a subversive document. Mm. I, I love this. This is so. Here we are. This is Prince Edward going to Scotland. Yep. 
There he is arriving on the west coast, Lochanoum, I think, somewhere around there. He talks to Cameron of Lochiel, gathers a force, goes to Edinburgh, Battle of Preston Pans. And marches down, yes. down, down, as far as Derby, of course, which is as far south as he got, and that's um, prominently marked there. And there's General Wade, who was on the wrong side of the country. Oh, wow. He goes back up to Scotland, fights the Battle of Falkirk, and then eventually the Battle of Culloden. There we are. Oh yes, and on the way, that's right. He his um he had a he had a run in with the um the Brits on the way, so he lost one of his ships, didn't he? Mm. That's that. So only only the frigate that Bonnie Prince Charlie was on managed to get to Scotland. Hmm. Well, that is that's amazing. So that would have been a naughty thing to have in your house, wouldn't yes. it? Yes. I mean, it was sold in Covent Garden, as you can see there, but the seller is not named, mm. so he was being careful, yeah, whoever careful. was distributing that. Oh, I love it. Right, what have we got next? Now, this large folder contains just some of George III's maps from the Seven Years' War. Right, which he became king in the middle of. Through, yes, yeah. exactly. Um, 1756 to 63, he becomes king in 1760, and this is a map of... Oh, that's Minden, Minden the great exactly. forgotten victory. 1059, a year of victories. And this map is by William Roy, who was one of the founding fathers of the Ordnance Survey, okay. one of the great figures of 18th century map making in England. But it, it has flaps. Oh, I've never seen see. that before. That's amazing. So you can follow the progress of the battle. Yeah, they are being they, pushed back. Wow. And then the Allies and then it all advance. breaks up, yes. So you can follow the progress of the battle rather than just seeing the starting so, lines, if you like. so beautiful, isn't But the it? level of detail, I mean, yeah. every... I mean, you need a magnifying glass. Completely. And a very long, detailed account of the battle as well. It's a, it's a piece of It serves of so many purposes, right, completely, yeah. completely. It was the big controversy, wasn't there? The Sackville, the British yes, cavalry right. commander, didn't, Lord George Sackville, was, you know, didn't didn't cover himself with glory. Well, he, he said three times refused to charge the okay. French and was court-martialed as a result. And this map was used in evidence in, in the trial. Court okay, um, is that not Quebec there? Have I just spotted Let's Quebec? Move it down in this step. Yes. Here we are. Here we go. Look at this. I don't believe it. I wrote a book about the siege of Quebec. That's the St. Lawrence River. Oh, That's printed, but this is... How have I never seen these before? They're beautiful. And it's, again, it's got the um, another, fold exactly, as well. Another flap, so you can see. Yes, you see, there they are landing at Ansar Foulon on the heights of Abraham, the battle. What a treat. So there's the Ilt. So they arrive up the channel. They have the landings here at the Montmorency Falls. Don't go very well. They go through the Narrows. Look, and here they are on their little rowing boats. And they land here and they, uh, they fight the battle here outside Quebec. That is a thing of absolute beauty. And you can see how heavily defended this coastline was. Hmm. Batteries there, batteries, redoubts. So they couldn't land here. So that's why they went through these narrows that are thought to be, you couldn't, you couldn't get through because of the artillery, but yeah. they did manage to get through. And then they landed on the, the west side of Quebec, which was very unexpected. Well, you've made my day. Good. Thank you very good, much. Good. Plenty more still to come. <laughs> so I suppose the, the war that George III is most remembered for is the War of American ah, Independence, yes. where he lost, lost the colony. And oh, we have a large group of material from this, both printed and manuscript. So this is very early on. 1776, this is when the Brits really should have ended, nipped this revolution right in the bud. Because they land on Long Island, they fight the Battle of Brooklyn Heights, and then they take, uh, they, they trap the American forces, but they manage to escape during the night across the East River. Mm. Ah, and then George Washington's watching it in Manhattan, and then he abandons Manhattan afterwards. Right, so we've got this, so New York Island, Harlem, yeah. this is, that's it, that's now this is Manhattan. Manhattan. Yeah. And Brooklyn, and so this is Brooklyn now. And there's this British assault onto Long Island. The rebel army just retreats, flight of the Americans, that's great. Mm. But this is the key point where they manage to cross this river in a sort of misty dawn and they escape totally un... Uh, Howe doesn't manage to trap them. It's the Dunkirk of the American Revolution. <laughs> really? Manages to get his army out in one piece. Published October 19th, 1776. So within, within a, two months yeah. of the uh, events themselves, prints such as these were being produced in London 
for mass consumption. This yeah. is how people followed the course of the war. It just gives you a huge amount of information, doesn't mm. it? Topographical. Mm. Oh, look, here we go. Well, here we are five years later. Well, there we go, yeah. This is the, this is the climax. So that's Yorktown there, is the yeah. Battle of Yorktown. So, so October of 1781. And look at this little detail here. Oh, no. Look the field that. where the British laid down their arms. Wow. It's yeah. a sense of finality about it, doesn't it? The world turned upside down, yeah. So they've got the French here, Washington Army here, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Virginia. And here's poor old Cornwallis and the Brits. Look at their fleet destroyed, look at that. Sunk. No help coming because the French, embarrassingly, had <laughs> chased the British fleet off. And here are the famous, the, you know, mm. the, the saps, they get mm. closer and closer and closer to Yorktown. So they're digging until, their way towards yeah, the And the heavy the guns British can just smash the defenses. British defences. Huh. When it becomes inevitable, they, uh, they surrender. Wow. And that is a turning, that's the birth of the USA, isn't it? Yes. So it must have been difficult for George. So, but this was in George III's collection. That's right. So yes. he sourced it yes. from Philadelphia. He wanted to have a look at it. Must have been painful viewing. Yeah, he was acquiring everything he could from, from whatever source, so he could get full information. But by the time he obtained this, it was all too late. Yeah, it was gone. Okay, what's next after, after Yorktown? What's well, next for the British going, Empire? We're going back a couple of centuries <laughs> okay. now, not the British Empire, but this is a body of material collected in Rome in the 17th century by mm. Cassiano dal Pozzo. That's the Battle of uh, Lepanto exactly. there, isn't it? The exactly. famous we have quite a, we have King quite Philip a of Spain's those. forces beat the Turks. And Lepanto, it was the, you know, the great naval battle that oh goodness, supposedly crushed the Ottoman yes. navy. But in truth, they were back at strength within a couple yeah, of years. It's the old but it was celebrated across Europe. It seems so to be the thing that saved Christendom, yeah. Such as these. Wow. were produced in great numbers. This is all Lepanto what here. An and you can see, I mean, this is the most extraordinary, right, exactly. So you've got the Turkish forces ranged in this ex remarkable crescent, and then the Christian forces facing them. And it was a battle of galleys, you know, these oared vessels. I mean, much yes. has been fought in ancient and, Greece. And, and you can see that they, they line up and then they come together and oh. it's just chaos. Chaos. The, the results. Extraordinary. You really get a sense of... That is amazing what it might have been. I mean, slow motion, of course, this would have been fought in as these galleys are drifting towards each other and then firing Absolute cannon and then engaging melee. hand to hand as well. But you can see little details down here as mm. well, the fighting taking place. And I mean, really close quarters. Yeah, this, oh, this would have been with you know, the oars clashing. The worst thing you can imagine. But again, these are all produced within, you know, a few weeks of the of the battle itself for this, what was now an insatiable European market for prints like this. And in some cases, such as this, let me just turn this over, they just used whatever paper they could. Oh my goodness. So that was printed on the back of a... <laughs> a Recycling. De a decorative engraving, exactly. They were so in need of paper to print this out. You just take something that had already been printed on and then print Lepanto on, on the other side. And I, I suppose they're printed in huge numbers because of the appetite. It, 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 instantly, it was regarded as a battle that halted the Ottoman advance on Europe, hadn't it? Yeah, for the previous 60, 70 years, the, the Ottoman threat to Western Europe had it, been terrifying people, in Venice in, in particular. And it was thought that Lepanto was the great battle that would destroy mm. the Ottoman navy and Western Europe could breathe easily, but within... You know, a year or two, yeah, Ottoman forces were back at strength. Historians now them. think it's not quite the decisive no, battle it was once believed. Not at all. And historians yeah. are always doing that. They're always <laughs> saying these big decisive battles are never quite as decisive, isn't it? But at the time, it was regarded yeah. as game-changing. Yes, yeah. but it wasn't until a century later at the Siege of Vienna that, that the Ottoman tide mm. really did was turned. So this is a folio of engravings of the Siege of La Rochelle oh, yes. in the 1620s. Right. Uh, the, the French Protestants. The final defeat of the French Protestants, yeah. that's right. Um, you know, they'd been holding on and they were, this was their last stronghold. But maps like this, you have this wonderful combination of a, a straightforward flat map where you see the layout of the, mm. uh, of the, the defences and the siege lines, but also these charming little vignettes down here, yeah. which give some sense of, 
of life at, at camp. You have soldiers drinking with someone vomiting there. Oh, brilliant. If you could get close. Um, oh, yes, he's being sick. He's had too much so to this, drink. This is the life of a soldier in a long siege. I mean, there's well, not, not a great deal to do apart from... There's drinking, drinking but there's also what, illness, disease swept well, through those camps. Yeah. So it could, yeah. yeah. Wow, that's wonderful. What have we got here? Oh, Dettingen. Yes. So, War of the Austrian Succession, 1740s. George III's grandpa. Mm -hmm. And the last battle that a British monarch yeah. so fought in. Fought in, yeah. So, George II's on the battlefield. Victory yep. against the French. Mm -hmm. And here we have both manuscript and printed versions showing... Oh, quite a lot of detail. I, I, maybe Huge you can explain what's going on there. Wow. I, I can't follow... That is amazing, oh, isn't it? Laid out, Unfortunately, it was a big coalition effort, so they have all the different colours, probably all different forces and people involved. And again, showing different points of the, the battle as well. We get, we're getting... I mean, this is the same bit of land. Mm. General, so, Wolf, General Wolf was there as a young man, actually. I think. Was he? Yeah. And yeah. it was being fought ac across the river. There were... Is yeah. that right? There yeah. were they lines on different sides of the river. Yeah. But you get a real sense of actually firing here. Yes, you've you got do, yeah. musket yeah, smoke yeah, coming yeah, out of the it's fierce, isn't it? out of the and they're very close. They're really pushed in close together there. And this is the march of the French army. They come round here, cross the river, and then they attack from the death inside. Right. Oh, so what we have this is a detail of that. This yeah. It, yeah, that's blown so. up yeah. there because it is so complex what's happening down here. They needed a little detail to yeah. expand upon that. And there you have all this other little map here, not a map, but the, uh, the different regiments fighting and who was commanding them, all lined up. And to give some sense of how complex uh, an organisational challenge a battle like this was, how, how do you know what's happening? How do you de determine the order of yeah. battle? You use pieces of paper. Yeah. You write it down that this is the only way that you can command. The pen is absolutely as important as the bayonet and the musket in these battles because otherwise you're in the wrong place, you end up firing on your own men. You've got to deliver, the, you've got to deliver everybody to where you want them on exactly. the day. Yep. Staff work is increasingly important in these battles. And it is so fortunate that this material survives, that George III was so fascinated by yeah. the subject that he kept it all together as a resource to the end of his life. But it's an amazing resource, isn't it? Because also you, you would... Subsequent generations would look at these and, and learn from them hmm. and how, the, how, how this army was able to wheel round and face the French coming from that direction. Yep. There's also something so special about seeing these inside Windsor Castle, the building where presumably they've been for generations. Yeah, they've been here for almost 200 years. Um, George III had them in his library in Buckingham House during his lifetime, but 15 years after his death, the collection was moved to Windsor Castle. And so these have been here in these rooms uh, ever since. But as you're seeing them now, all flattened out and in archival sleeves. This isn't obviously how George III preserved them, which were just crammed into boxes at the time. Really? Fifteen boxes squeezed in um, until until quite recently. And you know, obviously, we now we conserve them in portfolios and drawers like this, and it just makes them so much easier to access as well. And now, these maps are accessible from anywhere in the world. The complete library of over four thousand maps has been digitised in high resolution and put online, free to access. They've gone a long way from the big boxes to being available for everyone yep. in the world online in and astonishing detail. Hi folks, I'm Dan and I'm on a History Hit TV adventure in Antarctica. You should subscribe because we've got a lot more of this kind of thing coming up, including digs on the former battlefields of the Western Front. As subscribers, you can use the code YouTube to get 50% off your first three months.